So I'm excited to announce and introduce Deborah Anya Ibe, who is the consultant facilitator for the Lower Santa Fe watershed planning process. It took a while to get here, but we're really glad she's here. And so, um, you know, it's one of those things where, where um, it has taken a while, but I think we've got the right person. So with that, I think one of the things we should do this morning is introductions um, so that Deborah has a sense of all the people that are um, part of this a meeting. So, Maury, you want to start? You've already met. Uh, go ahead, Maury. Hi again, Deb. Yep, I'm Maury. I'm the executive director of the Santa Fe Watershed Association, and we're really excited to work with you and all the folks on this call and beyond to, to help move this plan forward and increase collaboration. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on, so it's a really important time, and we're really grateful you're here. Do you want to introduce yourself? Pardon? I'm Paul Murray. I'm with the La Cienega Valley Association here in La Cienega. How long have you been a member of the association? Uh, have you served on the board? This, I think, is my 12th year. Okay, got it. Not quite Thank as long you. as you did. <laughs> okay, Kier? Yeah, hi. My name is Kier. My wife, Carol, and I live in El Canyon, which is down by the Santa Fe River. And we're downstream irrigators, and we have senior water rights that we share with the Bureau of Land Management. And we're, of course, we're concerned about this proposed pipeline and the decreased flows in the Santa Fe River. And Deborah, that is one of the stops we'll make when I, when we do the tour. We'll stop by and see uh, Kieran Carroll um, in their special little place along the river. Andy, your turn. Sure. Um, Andy Otto, I'm on the executive committee of the Northern New Mexico group of the Sierra Club. Amara? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, hi, I am the director of stewardship and outreach at the Santa Fe Watershed Association, work closely with Maury. And um, yeah, excited you're in this role and look forward to working with you. Um, Mr. Me. Uh, William Me, our fear of village association and other entities in our fear. Uh, he is the de facto mayor of our fear, but that's a whole different. <laughs> oh, yeah. I well, you know, the last guy that claimed to be mayor, they shot at him, so I don't claim that. <laughs> <laughs> That's all of Fria. Uh, anyway, Bobby? Hi, I'm with um, Rivers Run Through Us and uh, multiple other um, kind of, yeah, <laughs> activist, artist um, things and uh, been working with the Santa Fe River um, Collaborative since the beginning, pretty much. And um, yeah. That's it. And one of the few people that's walked the entire river. <laughs> Correct? <laughs> Christine Chavez, it's so good to see you. How are you today? I'm doing great, Carl. How are you? <laughs> All right. Great. The person uh, who has saved more, more water than anyone else in Santa Fe. <laughs> and I, I will always give you that, that uh, recognition. Well, well, thank you, Carl. <laughs> um, collectively, I think maybe this whole group uh, may have saved the most water in Santa Fe. But um, my name is Christine Chavez, and I manage the City of Santa Fe's Water Conservation Program. Nice to see you all. Andy, I'm not sure I know you. Andy, right? Yeah. Hi. Uh... So, oh, there's a camera there. Um, so I'm, 
I'm a, a new project specialist with the city of Santa Fe, working directly with uh, Zoe Isaacson. Uh, started about uh, a month ago working for the city's uh, river and watershed section here in uh, parks. So uh, just kind of popping in to uh, see what you uh, see what your folks are up to and uh, kind of learn some more about the programming out here in Santa Fe. Where'd you come from? Uh, I was previously at UT Austin uh, in Texas. Okay. Recent graduate then, huh? Uh, uh, somewhat. I was I was te uh, teaching out there. So, um, oh, cool. Excellent. But, uh, yeah, uh, excited to be out here in Santa Fe. Welcome. Uh, Mr. Miller, nice to see you or hear from you. Yeah, good morning. My apologies. I have a malfunctioning camera this morning, but I'm Matt Miller with Congresswoman Teresa Ledger Fernandez's office. Just wanted to see what was happening with you all. It's been a while, Carl, so I wanted to, to hop on this call. Unfortunately, I, I have a Another call at 11, so I'm going to have to jump off around then, but thanks for having me. Hey, nice to have you aboard. Erin English, how are you today? Hey, good morning. My name is Erin. I live in the village of Agua Fria, also along the river. Um, I'm also a water nerd and water engineer with biohabitats. I've been doing a little bit, of, a little bit of volunteer work with the Watershed Association, so excited to hear the updates. Uh, Bill, we missed you. Go ahead. Uh, you can please introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. Uh, Bill Schneider. I'm the Santa Fe Water Resources and Conservation Manager, as well as the uh, Program Manager on the San Juan Chama Return Project. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And finally, one of my favorite people, Patricio Pacheco. Hey, good morning, Carl. You saved the best I for last, Patricio. huh? <laughs> yeah. Just kidding. Good to see everyone this morning. My name is Patricio Pacheco, Water Resource Conservation Specialist here with the City of Santa Fe. Right. So I think that's everybody. <clears throat> so Deborah, why don't you introduce yourself, talk a little bit, and then you can discuss the results of the survey. Okay, good morning, everyone. I am also sorry my camera is not working for me this morning. Um but next time, hopefully you guys will be able to see my bright, shiny face. Um, so a little bit about me, I'm gonna go a little bit about me and then I'll talk to you about the entire project outline, what, what I was consulted to do, where we're headed. And then I will go over the data that we get, gathered from the survey. So um, I have a master's degree in hydrology a master's degree in environmental planning and design, and a bachelor's degree in um, community design uh, from UNM. So, you know, go Lobos. Um, I previously, before I started my company, I worked with the Pueblo of Zia for about four years. I um, was the director of environmental resources and public works. I started their um, EPA grant funded programs. Um, and while I was working it there, I oversaw 21 projects and brought in about $14 million. So um, none of this is super new to me. I had to do, I did their watershed management plan along with the Army Corps um, and managed basically everything. Um, so I started my company though, because while working with the Pueblo of Zia, I really realized what a deficit um, a lot of the tribes and rural areas are in when it comes to funding, when it comes to um, having their voice heard on some of these projects, when it comes to sustainability and environmental um, um, uh, protection projects. So I started my business to try to help those communities get grant funding, uh, manage some of their projects, do watershed management, et cetera, et cetera, which is why I... Um, was hired with the county to consult on the um, Santa, Lower Santa Fe River Watershed Plan. So um, the point of the project, as I'm sure you have guessed, is to complete the Lower Santa Fe River Watershed Plan. Um, this is about, a, it's a year long project. We just started in September. So we're only about a month in at this point. 
But our first goal of the project was to kind of get an idea of the familiarity first with the San Juan trauma return flow pipeline project. What do people think about it? What do people know about it? Um, and so we sent out a survey that had about 15 questions on it. Um, we only got 53 responses, but considering that I think we had it out for like 10 days, that's that's pretty good. Um, so um, Carl, if you'd like, I can go over those results now, or if you guys have questions or comments at this point, we can. Okay, and real quickly, I want to just, uh, Kathleen McLeod just uh, joined us. She is an artist and uh, instigator of, in La Siena Guia. I love an instigator. So go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So go ahead. Okay, so we had 53 responses to the survey, as I said. Um, most people were somewhat familiar with the um, San Juan Chama Return Flow Pipeline project. About 37% were familiar with it. Um, we had 29% um, that were very familiar with it, but we didn't quantify what that meant, right? So we didn't have the ability to be like, how do you mean you're familiar? That's just not something you can really grasp in a survey. However, 98% of the respondents are concerned that the, pro the project is gonna reduce the flow of water in the river. Um, and then only like 2% were not concerned, which, you know, who knows? I obviously, this is an anonymous survey, so I don't know who answered what, um, but there's that. 89% um, they said they had concerns with the project. And then the follow-up question was, if you do have concerns, please explain them. So we got about 40 responses to please explain. And they ranged from the water quality um, being deteriorated, um, sewage treatment plant that's been out of compliance more often than not, and that the pipeline might increase toxins to the Rio Grande, uh, the limited flows to some of the acequias, the riparian habitat. It was sort of just a range of things. Some were, what we saw the most was the flow in the Santa Fe River and the reduction in water quality. Um, and the treatment plant came up several times as well. I actually have my executive assistant um, working on quantifying these results so that we can see what percentage answered with certain answers so we can see what was the most popular answer. Um, so that's the next kind of step. Um, so the main concerns with the project were personal um, concerns with about 20% of those being connected through, con through tradition, right? So a secular use, um, agriculture, those sorts of things. Um, and then, I asked about engagement um, and, you know, 40% said they wanted to be engaged in the process. But then um, the next question was, um, do you feel like you are listened to when you comment on a planning project? And this is something I talked to Carl and Maury before about <clears throat> was that we know that overall, and I'm sure a lot of you can attest to this as well, a lot of times our, we feel like our comments or our concerns fall on deaf ears, right? And so we'll comment all day on a project and how we want it to go, but that doesn't mean it's going to shape the um, future of that project. And so 57% um, of people said that they don't feel like they're heard when they are part of a planning process. And so that's something that we, we really want to focus on um, as we move forward with this process is making sure that people do feel like they're heard and that their um, comments are um, responded to as applicable because we all know, you know, you can't make everyone happy and we won't and just be prepared for that. Um, and then the next question was, are you aware that a lower Santa Fe watershed plan is being developed? 70% knew about it, which is awesome. 80% um, about wanted to be involved in the development of the plan, which is awesome um, and also terrifying because I realized that was only 80%, but that's 80% of our respondents and our respondent pool was kind of small. But if you extrapolate that to the community members and other associations, um, that's gonna be a lot of people that wanna be involved and which is fine, but that obviously complicates things. Um, 
However, um, what I didn't mention before is that in working with the tribes, I had to go to council meetings uh, regularly. And I feel like, and I've told Carl this too, I feel like, you know, once you've dealt with tribal council, you can pretty much navigate any situation. So I think we'll be okay as long as we are um, straightforward and honest about the process and about where we're at in the in the process as well. So the next question was an open-ended question. And that question was, what factors are most important to you to be addressed in the lower Santa Fe watershed planning process? The very, one of the very first answers that we received was equity, environmental justice for all beings in the watershed, plants, animals, the river, the water, land, and air, which I think that kind of sums up what we're looking for here. Um, also communication, transparency, they're worried about water quality and quantity, presentation of science-based facts like day-to-day -day diversions, uh, water treatment, sharing water fairly. Again, this is another question that my executive assistant is working on um, quantifying for us so we can see what the, the most answered questions were or responses were. Um, but I think that this question leads into the next phase of the plan, which is creating a equitable engagement uh, plan, communication plan, um, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a moment. But this, this question will really help lead us in the direction that we need to go as far as addressing some of these concerns in the engagement plan. Um, and then we asked for contact information. We got about 40 people's contact information. Um, which is a small portion, but this survey was only given out to, um, it wasn't circulated through the community at this point because we were really trying to gauge familiarity with the plan from the associations and organizations involved. Um, in a few weeks, we will be putting out a community survey that will go to all of the community members um, that will ask different questions and will be more applicable, applicable to the watershed plan itself. Um, we asked what the best way to contact people was. Um, a lot of people said email, some people said in person. Um, so, you know, that's another thing that she's quantifying as well. well email by far though, it looks like won that conversation. Um, so there's that and then Question number 15 was, if you have additional comments, please enter them here. Again, these were um, anonymous. However, having spoken to some people, I can tell who answered some of these questions. Um, I won't say any names, um, but this is another thing that she's gonna compile for me. There was only, let me see, there's only 15 answers to that question. So it's kind of short. Um, but people in this section really were worried about that water treatment plant. And in my communications with several members of other associations, that has come up a lot. So obviously that's something that we'll address in the plan. Um, whatever address means, right? That doesn't mean we come up with solution for it. That doesn't mean that we uh, fix the problem because I personally can't fix that problem and it would take a whole slew of people to fix that problem, um, but we'll address it. We'll figure out what we can do about that. Um, so as I said, the next phase of that of this project is that I'm going to be, it's about the next, I think 10 or 12 weeks, I'll be creating an equitable community engagement plan. So what that is, is I'll identify all the stakeholders with the help of all of you and others, um, and of course, Michelle, um, to develop a list of stakeholders. We'll see who needs to be involved in the conversation. We'll see how they best want to communicate. We'll see, we'll talk about how we should should do outreach to the community. We It'll outline our exact plan for who we're communicating with and how. Um, of course, that includes our tribes and pueblos that are directly impacted. Um, you know, all of you, other associations, other villages and neighborhoods. Um, and so that's going to be a pretty comprehensive document. 
Because what we want to do is we want to make sure that everyone is on the same playing field as far as communication is concerned. You know, we can reach out and say, hey, this is what we're doing. If they choose to not participate, we will know that as well. I do keep a communication log of everyone that I contact, everyone who receives an email, a survey, a Zoom meeting, phone call, face-to-face -face meeting. I keep a I keep a log of that. The reason I keep a log of that is because in these projects in the past, I've had people, for instance, I did a, a project with Native American Fish and Wildlife Service where I worked with 121 tribes in the Southwest region. And um, I contacted every tribe several times. And after the project was done, because it was to get funding, I heard from a lot of people, I was never contacted. I never heard about this project. I didn't know this was happening. Well, then I could go back and say, actually, I called you for called your office four times. I went to your office. I spoke to your governor, whatever the case was. That way we can keep track and make sure that everyone is contacted. Now, if they call in, they say, I never heard about this um, and they aren't on my list. That's my fault. Right. I'll take responsibility for that. Um, but we just want to make sure that everyone has an equal chance at engagement. Um, the engagement plan will also outline how we'll deal with the responses that we get from the community. How will we catalog those? How will we try to include those in the plan? If we do, what is our system for what we include and what we don't include? Because we have to have that as well. It'll outline what we will be, what we will negotiate on and what we will not negotiate on. For instance, if we, um, choose not to, this is an example, this is a bad example, but it's an example. If we choose not to address at all the wastewater treatment plan, we can say that's non-negotiable, we're not putting it in. Then everyone who comes up with that, we can say, sorry, that's a non-negotiable, we're not putting it in. Of course, that's not the case. That is not the case in this situation. That was just an example. Um, so we'll develop that. And like I said, this will be developed with all of you. So I will be sending out um, not surveys, but kind of outlines as, as I go to Michelle to distribute as she sees fit um, of, hey, are we hitting the right points? What other stakeholders do I need to add? Um, who needs to be main points of contact on this? All of those different things so that we can develop that plan. Like I said, that's a, about a 12 week uh, plan. We're about in week three right now. So I've been developing that outline and starting to fill in a little bit of information based on what I know. Um, and then in, in another, well, let's see, in about 10 weeks from today, nine weeks from today, I'll be distributing another survey. So that survey is going to be out to the community. I'll ask for all of your help in distributing that um, along with others, of course. And that'll be more focused questions to the community about how they want to be engaged, how they best communicate, what they want out of the watershed plan, and what are their biggest needs, concerns, et cetera, specifically for the watershed plan. Um, that'll help to just kind of button up the community engagement plan and make sure that those voices are heard. Um, and then that also helps us proceed with how we do community meetings, how, like, do we do them over Zoom? Do we do them in person? Are we, do I make time for quote unquote office hours to talk to people individually? Um, I know a lot of people don't wanna talk in a big group, right? They don't wanna voice their concerns necessarily in front of other people, but they'll do it one-on-one. -on -one. So I'll make myself available for that as well. Um, and then of course, the development of that survey as it was this time, Carl will be distributed to a select group of people who will be able to edit, review, et cetera, before that goes out to the community. Um, so that's where we are now in the project. The, that's our next couple of steps. Um, like I said, we do have a, a year from September to complete this, um, but so far we're right on track. So, um, but I would like to hear from you guys if you guys have questions or comments, concerns, um, with anything I've said. Um, I definitely like to discuss that. I'm also going to put my contact information in the chat so that you guys can um, contact me anytime, um, offline, online, whatever you guys need to do, and we can discuss it further.
um, questions, comments. Got questions? Thought that was a pretty good presentation. Bill? Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's a very impressive resume, uh, Deborah. Um, thank you. So, so I, I guess one thing that you haven't clearly articulated, I'm curious, is whether this lower Santa Fe River planning process will essentially start with the point of the San Juan Chama return project in place, meaning no Colorado River water in the lower Santa Fe River? That is a great question. Um, the answer, in my opinion, is yes and a little bit of no. So what I normally do in these plans is kind of attack it from both sides. So if this happens, these are our concerns. If it doesn't happen, these are our concerns. So that we kind of have it as a overall scope of the possibilities for the watershed. Understood, I think. Um, okay, I'll, I'll hold for the comment. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Impressive. I, I've right. got, uh, I've got okay. a- I'm sorry. No worries. A question that might be for kind of a combination of Deb and Michelle and Bill or anyone else on the call is, you know, that the the city is also doing the wastewater master plan right now. And so I'm wondering if anyone would like to speak to or if we would like to workshop as a group ways to to dovetail these two planning efforts like uh, Deb was talking about with an equitable engagement plan things like that, you know, that seems also very relevant in the master planning process for the wastewater treatment plant. Um, so, you know, it seems serendipitous that these two planning processes are happening at the same time. And even though they're kind of different, they're connected. Um, so I'd love to hear people's thoughts on that dovetailing potential. I can, I can answer part of that. Um, I think that yes, right, they'll definitely be, that'll be part of our stakeholder engagement. We know that the city is working with us on, on this as well. However, and I want to give a big however, what we want may be in direct contradiction with the, the treatment plant plan that they're putting out. So of course I want to engage, of course I want to see what their thoughts are, how we can dovetail those, as you said, but that's only going to be as possible as they want it to be possible, right? So will I try? Yes, I will try. How far I will get, I do not know. Um, Michelle, do you have any additional comment? Um, Maury, I think it's really important to take it all as conceptually as a, I'm just gonna go back to the one water concept because of you know where we are with things in this high desert. I, I, I think what you've said is incredibly important. I hope that that is a possibility. And I, I think you're right, I think it's serendipitous. I mean, you know, and, and a few people here know that it was an incredible, nearly year long struggle to get this awarded and for it to have been awarded at the exact same time as the city's doing this other planning really is, you know, I, I, I do think it's almost serendipitous. And so I really hope that these two things are able to dovetail like we hope that they, they can. And so I think that it's a terrific comment. I think it's really important for us to, to think about that. And I really think we need to hopefully bring John Dupuy into this conversation because, you know, sure, Bill sits on the water side of things and, and there's certainly some wastewater part of what he does, but it's, it's right, it's right now it's separate. And I think we need to hear from someone who is, um, you know, leading that charge. And I don't think that we should force Bill into that box because it's not his box. 
and I, I don't think it's fair to him actually for us to lean on him so heavily to add to the wastewater conversation when he is um, focused on other parts of the, of the bigger picture, you know, with water. And so um, I think it's an excellent comment, Maury, and I think we need to explore it. And I'll, I'll have a conversation with Dupuy about how to figure that out or how to integrate it as best we can. I, I certainly take Deb's um, comment very seriously because um, she's leading this effort for us. And so um, I think she's right. You know, we, we, we can try and I think it's, we need to try. So thank you for that comment. And I agree with you. I do think it's important to consider that. You want to comment? Are you, are you asking me, Carl? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think Michelle did an incredible job articulating sort of the uh, the organizational challenges we have at the city. But, you know, I really do agree. And, and I think this is a unique opportunity and we really need to seize the moment. I feel like we have an incredible amount of momentum. I do think the city is, I think I know the city is committed to improvements to the Paseo Real water reclamation facility including potentially rebuilding a new one entirely. That's certainly being explored. Um, water quality, what I heard Deborah say is of a critical element to this planning process. The city can support that. I only come back again, Carl, Deborah, and Michelle to the point of if we effectively can acknowledge and recognize that this planning process does not include San Juan Chama water, I think we will make an immense amount more progress. Okay. If we continue to bring the pipeline back into the conversation, we're going we're gonna to slow this down to a screeching halt, at least on the city side. Okay. Uh, I don't think there's Michelle, any do you agree? Uh, Carl, do you agree with that statement? Yeah, yeah. I don't think there's any in intention to bring the pipeline into the conversation. I think we're, we all have all kind of agreed that that's beyond what we're going to be attempting to do here. And I think that in terms of, of future, there are things we'll all talk about in a little while that that may help um, that water flow um, and that flow. And, and I think there are things, I mean, one of the things we would love to see if there's some way we, that we can get return flow credit for pushing water down the Santa Fe River. Uh, that's a long-term complicated proposition, uh, but it's not impossible. And so those are the kind of things that we'll look to. But no, Bill, I think you can be assured that we're not going to demand somehow that San Juan Chama River water come into um, into the flow of the pipeline. We uh, expect that it will be all sent up to the to be return flow process. So no, I don't I don't think you need to worry about that. But I do want to you know you and I had a little conversation yesterday and it's one of those things where where all of a sudden I go, oh well wow, that's kind of cool. And we talked about the possibility of this new pipeline, uh, not the new treatment plant, uh, being a county city project. And to me, when we start mentioning those kinds of things, I think that builds on what we're doing here. It is an opportunity for the county to be involved. I think the county can bring things, but the county can bring things to the table, but they also have a need as we go forward in the future. I mean, while we have our septic tanks out here and at some point you start thinking about maybe it's time to start having some sort of uh, wastewater system. And so to have that as, a, a, as part of the possibilities, I think it just opens the door in terms of, of what we can do and what we can do as, a, as both the city and county working together. Um, more and more of that needs to happen. I think Bill would agree with that. Uh, there's certain elements of, of you know, it's not like water issues stop at the border between the city and the county. Um, they continue on. And so we need to, to ensure that we're doing everything we can to, to build that relationship, support that relationship, uh, support what the city's doing, support what the county's doing. Um, and I think that that really is kind of the future of water in, in uh, the Santa Fe area. Any comments? 
Okay, with that, let's go to Miss Hunter. And I want to in introduce Michelle a little bit and, and embarrass her if I can. Um, I have to say that this entire process was a result of her and John Dupuy and the city folks working together. Uh, Michelle has carried the banner uh, exceptionally well. Uh, she's been involved uh, sincerely carrying uh, all of those terms in terms of what happens with water in the Santa Fe area. Um, and I appreciate all that she does um, and look forward to her presentation on the well monitoring and well testing, uh, water testing program. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks, Carl. Um, I really don't have so much to report yet because Amy and I are still working through the scope of work for the next chunk of work that, that Daniel B. Stevens will assist the county um, doing for the well monitoring program in La Cienega and La Cienega. We've had some brainstorming um, conversations, Amy and I, and we, we think we have some ideas for how to work with the, um, the state uh, anti-donation clause, because we really want to give away these smart meters to, to folks who are willing to, to take them. And so we're still working through how to, how to do that with a local organization. And, I, and until I'm able to kind of hammer things down more, I don't really... I think it's inappropriate for me to like say who the organization is and how they would work with us. But, you know, it will it would be a, a governmental entity that has um, water conservation in their uh, in their purview. And so we we think that and Cristela Valdez, my attorney on this, is still working through some of those details to see if that's going to work out. But that's our goal is to give away these four hundred dollar meters to folks who are interested in putting them on their wells to, you know, to see how much water they're using throughout the, throughout the year. Um, so that's still kind of coming along. What we did do is last week we went out to about six well sites and we sampled, Danny B. Stevens and I were out and we sampled six wells. Um, most, you know, a couple of them were community type wells and a couple of them were private wells situated in, in areas that I think would be a good, would give us a very good understanding of whether or not the, um, the Army National Guard's facility on the Santa Fe City Airport has migrated past the airport property. Um, the DOD is kind of gearing up to do their next phase of investigation. But I think it's going to be another year before they're they're able to, to take the next step, which would be a, a remedial investigation in, in the Superfund process. And so, um, as we all know, the federal government moves very slowly. So um, the city and the county are working on a different funding source so that we can investigate this impact ourselves instead of depending on the net, on the federal government to fund this investigation. I, I don't, I, you know, I've watched these kinds of investigations go on over the course of my years at the environment department. And I'm not super confident that there's going to be a lot of movement on the DOD side of this. So, we thought we should take this environmental project into the city and the county and an attempt to characterize this groundwater impact ourselves with money that is available through the environment department. So, I mean, this isn't the well program per se, but it affects what goes on in the well program area because it's La Cienega and La Cienega. And so to me, these two, it's another one of those situations, Maury, where it sort of serendipitously um, happened. And so we've kind of combined these two efforts to see what we can do with, with more funding. Um, but that's where we are right now. I will probably meet with Amy next week at Daniel B. Stevens to 
to talk with her about the next step in the scope of things. We will eventually, once we've hammered down the money situation with the NMED, we will likely go out to RFP again to find a consultant to help us with that characterization. So that's where we kind of are with the well program and the, the kind of coinciding PFAS investigation in this area. And we're hoping to kind of synergize those two efforts so that they will create more sort of value to the, to the community, um, the, both La Cienega and uh, La Cienega. So that's kind of all I have today, but I just wanted to let you <clears throat> know where we were. That's a lot. So uh, Amy, explain who Amy is. She is the consultant working with you that's been hired to help with the well monitoring and well uh, testing. Yes, she, she is a program manager, I believe at uh, Daniel B. Stevens. Amy Ewing and I actually went to uh, graduate school together for a little while at UNM. So we've known each other for a very long time and we work cool. really well together. And um, I'm really glad that she's the consultant on this because um, we do, we do have a very good relationship. And so I'm, I, I need to move this this along, and that's kind of the the plan at this point is to is to the next step is for Amy and I to get together and kind of figure out what the next six months looks like for that side of it. Yeah. Michelle, will you be testing anything be besides PFAS? Will you do? Will it be a range of the contaminants? Um, potentially, we probably will want to do that. The, the samples that we did take, we did a little bit of general chemistry on it just so we could help, it would help us to identify the different types of, of water that we see in La Cienega and La Cienega. Um, So we did take a, <clears throat> a little bit of, we have asked the lab to do a couple of other parameters and that may expand Carl because when you're characterizing a a groundwater plume, you do want to look at more than just the analytes of a specific concern. You do want to look at a broader array of, of analytes in order to kind of place the water, maybe age it or um, kind of try and figure out its provenance, which is helpful in uh, characterizing where a plume might go or where it's where we see effects or, you know, and so painting a bigger picture with a few more general chemistry analytes is, is very important. So we are gonna try and do that. It, as, as the PFAS um, project goes along, I think that will certainly do more in terms of looking at other analytes. The well program itself, obviously, as you know, it's more of a, of a water resources, water quantity kind of study. And so um, that one, we probably won't do any more sampling with, but the but the PFAS one, we will. So I would imagine so, yeah. Well, I think we're all just generally concerned about what's, what's happened with the wetlands below and the wells nearby, um, yeah. because it's been, uh, it's been, it's been there for a while. And the cumulative effect is something I think we're all uh, a little bit concerned about. The other question I had is, um, can we speed up the RFP process? What can we do to help that get through procurement faster? Oh, John and I have talked about that with respect to the, the RFP that we'll have to put out once we have the NMED funding. And so we're going to determine which entity is the better entity to do it. And it I mean, the city takes a while too, but it seems as though they're moving faster than we are on procurement right now. So it may end up being a city procurement as opposed to a county procurement. Um, I will also try and grease the skids a little bit with our procurement folks to kind of give them a heads up and hopefully it will, it will go a little faster. I do think that they've hired at least one person into that group, into procurement. So hopefully it will go faster than than it did. Do you ever do a sole source? Um, sure. I, I, I yeah, but this isn't appropriate for that because the sum of money is so high. It's it's going to be a potentially a multi million dollar project. Okay. 
Hello. Yeah. So, Any Michelle, questions? It, yeah, I just was hoping I, I even understood. So, Michelle, can you clarify? So the concern is that the National Guard has done an investigation at the at their former site at the at the Santa Fe Airport, has identified various components of PFAS in both soil and groundwater. And then you're mentioning then the next steps would be to characterize the nature and extent and determine whether PFAS has migrated offsite. The, with the concern being that, particularly with Sangia, there are domestic wells nearby. We have the Ancha formation and very shallow groundwater, therefore potential threat of exposure. Is that a general sort of where we are? Because uh, yeah. I've been getting pieces and I, I haven't connected the dots. You're exactly right, Bill. And, um, and so I think I've explained this, but maybe I haven't to this group and to you, Bill, is that there is... Um, emerging contaminant funding available through the Clean Water State Revolving Loan Fund. And that money has no match, which is unusual for uh, federal money through the SRF. It usually has a match component. This does not. And um, because there is the potential for the, sl for the city sludge facility to be a contributor to this. It doesn't look like that's the case with the data that, that the city has recently collected and had analyzed. Does not look like the city would, would be a significant contributor to this issue. But because it's a possibility, that funding is available to us. And, and when asked, when I asked the NMED if it was contingent upon the city being a contributor, they said no. So the fact that the city has a sludge has a sludge um, facility nearby helped us to uh, be able to qualify for the money, but it doesn't. It's not like a deal breaker with respect to actually getting it. And so it looks as though the state and the feds will allow us to kind of characterize the nature and extent of this plume and maybe not so much nature, but more extent because I'm unclear on whether or not the DOD would let us onto the facility to drill any wells, but we can get pretty close. And so um, maybe it's more of an extent. They have to do the, the nature. <laughs> we get to do the extent way ahead of them. And so we want, if we can, we want to make sure that we can stop this from migrating to wells that are very close by and near and less nearby to make sure that this isn't a runaway plume like it is in Clovis. And, you know, that plume is already, I think it's like three and a half miles long or something. It's just incredible. So we want to, we want to figure out what the extent of this is bef and not wait on the federal government to do it. And so your summation was good, Bill. I'm unclear about what kind of nature we can do, but I think extent, we definitely have the ability to, to do that. Thank you. Sure. Well done. Very uh, detailed. Um, any other questions, questions for Michelle? Okay, so now I'm going on to the spring restoration of La Cienega and La Cienegia. Um, And this is something, it's really funny. So we, we have a little water planning committee for the La Cienega Valley Association. And we've been meeting for a few months and at our last meeting we realized we need to do something differently. Um, and one of the things is, is the folks that were attending the meeting looked at us and said, hey, you're the water experts. Why don't you write the plan and then we'll review it, kind of. And so I think that is what Andrea LaCruz Crawford, I and some other folks in, in the community will be doing over time. Um, but one of the things I've always talked about is my plan to restore this, the Springs of La Cienega. And Andrea looked at me and says, well, write it down. <laughs> so it's always been in my head. And I, I made an attempt last night to write it down. I figured it would just be a few sentences here and there. And as I went into it, it got more and more complicated. 
Um, Maureen knows this well, she's seen it, um, and it needs some work. And so I'm not gonna share the document right now, but I will go through what I've written so far. Uh, it's a six step process. Uh, all of these things are doable. Uh, all of them they all present different types of challenges. Um, but the goal is to re to help the spring flows in La Cienega and by that help the flow of water in the river, uh, Santa Fe River and the La Cienega Creek. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that, that um, I think this plan uh, can help improve spring flows. And one of the first things I'm going to start with, this is some I, many of you have already heard, but there are four wells that the El Dorado area sanitation water and sanitation district uh, located in the Ancha um, Tsuki formation. Um, those have gone down over time. Um, and what uh, Peggy Johnson and Stacy Timmons determined in 2015 was that those wells were hydrologically connected to the springs in La Cienega which meant they had an impact on our spring flows. And so a number of years ago, the Los Angeles Valley Association, when I was president, wrote a letter to the, to the district and asked them to take those wells offline. At the time, they seemed to be understandable. For one thing, the, the wells had, been, had gone down, and I think they had stopped using them as much. Um, and so we've asked them, and this was a number of years ago, so it's something we need to follow up with, but to ask them to take those wells offline, then you only use them in an emergency situation. Now, this becomes even more possible because the uh, district has contracted with the county um, to acquire, I think it's 100 acre feet of water per year off of the Canyon Cito slash um, Canada de Los Alamos pipeline that they're putting in. Uh, the pipeline's put in because Canyon Cito has tremendous water quality issues. And I'm not sure how far that project is, uh, is along, but I think it's pretty close to being completed. And at it, that time, the. Uh, it's done, ahead. Carl. It's the. It's oh, wow. The El Dorado Canyon Cito pipeline. Okay. And Canada de los Alamos is a separate one. So, um, and it is done. Okay. The, just so you know. Thank you. Thank you for the correct update. Anyway, so um, that is definitely a possibility. And, and and I don't know how quickly that might impact our springs. Um, one of the questions I, I want to present to Stacey Timmons with the uh, Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources down in Socorro is how long it takes for water to travel from El Dorado to, um, to La Cienega. So and that's step Carl, one. That's, real quick, yeah. I don't know the answer to that, but... <laughs> I, I do know that we have signed a contract with El Dorado to deliver to them 200 acre feet per year so that they are off of their dependency on groundwater. So, yeah, I think it's definitely worth talking to Stacy about what kind of effect she thinks that we might see with them not them no longer pumping 200 acre feet per year. 200 acres, because I've heard 100 acres. That's great. 200. Yeah. That's, oh, wow. That's very, very cool. And that's, um, that was John Dupuy. You know, that was absolutely, he should get credit for that. Just so you know. <laughs> okay. All the credit in the world for that one. For I'll sure. shut up now. Appreciate it. Both you and he. Um, now, the other thing, I, now, all of these, again, are, are there's no sequence to these. These are just things that can be done um, whenever we feel we can manage them. Uh, one of the biggest challenges will be uh, expanding the, uh, the, um, the county uh, water system into La Cienega and La Cienega, primarily La Cienega, if not really any easy way to get into La Cienega. Um, and so one of the things we want to do, and this is where in the past we've also, we need to enforce this. We need to make sure people are on the county water. I mean, we have the La Cienega watershed conditions, which are also supported by county ordinance that anybody that comes within 200 feet of the county water system needs to hook up. Um, and so we want to encourage, support, incentivize, uh, residents to hook up to the to the county water system. And one of the first eight easiest places for us to, to really reach a number of people is along um, 
Los Pinos Road, as you come in by the racetrack, we have probably five or six different trailer parks there. And if you go back in time to the 1990s, that was temporary housing for all of the racetrack workers. Well, it's become permanent homes. People have lived there for 15 or 20 years. Um, and we need to understand how, what water resources they actually have because of the question whether or not they have water rights to support the, the number of homes um, and not homes, number of trailers that they, they have. Uh, but I'm estimating somewhere between 100 and 120 trailers are along that stretch. Uh, it wouldn't be a, uh, the pipeline, uh, the county pipeline comes right to the corner of uh, the um, Los Pinos and the frontage road. So it would be an easy run down. Uh, so that's one of the things that would, that would be an easy thing. But really what we want to do is get, build um, community um Excite, not excitement, uh, having people understand that what they do when they hook up to the water system is really helping the community. Um, and it's one of those things I think that we can do this through um, educational um, and informational brochures, newsletters, I think are really important. And I'm going to harp on this forever, ever, but they have to be bilingual. Uh, we can't avoid that anymore. There's too many people in our community that, that do not read or speak English very well. And we have an obligation to make sure they understand that they can participate and be involved in this. And we encourage them to, to do those kinds of things. And so that will be a major push. And I really think we need to look at how we can in, in, provide incentives for people hooking up to the, um, up, up, maybe we get figure out a way to, uh, find grant money to pay for meters um, or hookup fees or something that that will make it easier for people and less costly for them to connect to the county water system. So that's the second part. Um, now, this is a big one. And I hope Christine's still with us. Yes, uh, because we're going to steal a whole lot of information from her and the wonderful program that she does. But we need a comprehensive community wide water conservation, water harvesting program to include stormwater management and flood control. Sounds like a lot. We will, we will establish demonstration rain gardens that will provide opportunities for residents to learn how to construct their own. Uh, maintaining arroyos by keeping them clear of debris and building small berms to slow the flows of water and get more water into the aquifer. Um, and this is where I think this is a, a really important city county effort but the stormwater management, the floods that we've had in La Cienega and La Cienega have been major. And there's ways to stop that flow of water and slow it down. And my great grandiose idea is somehow acquiring that land that's on the north side of 599. It's where the Arroyo Chimiso and the Arroyo Hondo come through. Um, and acquire that land as uh, a way to slow the water down for two reasons. One, you prevent floods. The other thing is you start recharging the aquifer. And it's been done in other cities. Um, I think that we will steal things from Tucson because they've done some amazing things with, with flood control. But that way we can, I, I'm almost thinking you could turn it into a park, some sort of recreational area um, that would be, uh, just served a dual purpose. You'd have recreational opportunities, and then it would also prevent floods from rushing down and through our communities. So that's one another thing. Wetlands restoration is number four. Um, we've done some. We do need to do more. No, La Siena, Yeah, go ahead, William. You know, our our project on the Santa Fe River where we have some meandering going through, um, you know, the plantings are, are just really surviving uh, these heavy floods and they're slowing the water down quite a bit. So um, it's right above the County Road 62, um, you know, the extension of uh, Lopez Lane, the Cardo Oro Grant Road. Um, so, I mean, <clears throat> You know, that river project has really been good, and I think that could kind of be a model. But uh, we actually based a lot of our stuff on Tucson's, uh, you know, and Brad, Brad Lancaster. Okay. 
and you know, again, Christine is is very active in this. She's, um, I'm not sure how many Christine, how many rain gardens do we do? Does the city have now? Anyway, um, so, but again, this is something where you get people involved. You have an opportunity. We have a resource within our community, John Romans, who got a certificate from the the folks in Tucson. Um, who is very interested in this and I think would be very willing to teach people how to do these things. Um, and I think maybe we can do a program where we can get free rain barrels, give out um, free rain barrels, um, something like that for um, um, residents to be encouraged to participate. Bobby, go ahead. Bobby, you're off. Did you have a question? Okay, sorry. Not, not a question, but um, a suggestion. You were talking about education, um, uh, about the springs and groundwater and the aquifer and things like that. And one of the things that would be helpful, um, this is not something that I'm really skilled at, but to have an animation made that could go, uh, you know, they could go into schools, you know, just an animation that shows that you know, and the 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 um, the Santa Fe watershed has really cool ways to show where water goes and things like that. But they're you know they're little hands on deals with sand and you you know in a dropper and you can show like oh the well you know this is what happens when you put a well in. But to have it instead like you know those are really cool. But to have animations that could go out for further, you know, to exhibit what happens when you put a well in and what happens when you do this and why are you, when you put in 120 trailers or you know but I mean you know so that sort of thing and then you know get it into schools get it to you know somehow or another get it to the folks to people um you know rather than you know and doing brochures is great but um I think an animation would be um you really nice addition. powerful. So yeah. Yeah, I agree. So we'll try to figure out how to do that. Um you know, one of the things that that, that um Christine has done a marvelous job is uh right. programs for for kids who go to school in the city. I think it's in the fifth or sixth grade where they have a, a basically a program about um water conservation, water being smart about water. I think they have field trips. Well, that doesn't happen in the county. And so one of the things that, that I'm a part of is the Water Policy Advisory Committee. And we're looking at that and we're hoping to figure out a way that we can get this kind of information out to all the little communities everywhere from Edgewood to, to Santa Fe so that everybody can and get an understanding and learn from a very early age about the importance of water in our area. So that's, uh, I think that's really cool. And I think the animation thing is something that would be really neat. Um, I'm not sure how to go about it, but maybe we can figure that out. Um, so we went through wetlands restoration. Um, and this is probably the, the most controversial of all of my proposals. Uh, but we have water coming out of the county's pen quill treatment plant that serves uh, some part of, of 14. Um, I think it's going to be hooking up to Rancho Viejo. Um, and so they they treat that water. And my understanding now is that water is just sold to, um, to uh, developers, to builders. Um, and I wanna see if there's some way we can use that water after it's thoroughly cleaned um, possibly, would not possibly, but with a secondary uh, cleaning cleaning process, and inject that into the aquifer that that sits under uh, La Cienega and La Cienega. Again, we have to ensure that that the water that is injected is not contaminated. Um, that we're putting good water in there to to do that. But there's a sizable amount, and I think that amount of water will increase. And I think that would be one way to, to help build back the aquifer in our area. Um, and the last thing, this is something that's kind of um, been a while um, that we, go ahead, William. Um, so, you know, when the uh, penitentiary had, 
uh, through the county had that alfalfa project and they were watering the alfalfa, you got some of that uh, uh, return into the aquifer. Uh, I noticed the other day they were still watering, so I don't know, but they're not growing anything. But the idea too is like if you're growing alfalfa, the alfalfa is doing a remediation of that water also, you know, so maybe maybe that's a, a easy way to do this project um, without the possible contamination of that aquifer if your water is not that pure or yeah, your reclaimed yeah. water. One of the things that has happened over the last couple of years, and I think that that um, is that the um, county put in a whole new system. And this is something John Dupuy has talked about a lot. It's a modular system. Um, and I've looked this up and it, they're kind of cool because you can just kind of build them, you know, you can build them to, to, to the site. Um, thank you, Andy. Good to see you. Um, but you can build it to the site plan and you can do it in phases. And so this is one of the things I, that, that John Dupuy is looking at is the possibility of, of a new facility that would be uh, modular. And I think it would be uh, beneficial if we can get some folks out to check out the Penquil modular plan at some point. And the last one, um, this goes back a ways, but when the city expanded their, um, the Buckman well field, they added four supplemental wells. And in, that, in the approval of that application, the Office of the State Engineer required um, the city to provide offsets there's four locations in La Cienega and La Cienega where they have to put back water, basically. And so we need, it's, it hasn't been done. It's been a while since it's been um, kind of discussed. It may be forgotten by the bureaucracy, but it's something we need to, to bring back to the forefront and remind people this is part of the deal and look at ways that the city can um, help provide water to those communities that are impacted. So that's my plan, and I, I promise to get it in. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, William. Um, well, like on our Osage Well, there by uh, oh, where Osage Street comes into Aguafria Street, um, that well is under a uh, uh, a court ordered. Uh, can't think of the word. Uh, you know, it's limited to twenty five acre feet a year. And uh, when, uh, um, yeah, when when Claudia Bourchet came in, she was saying that she was going to pump, you know, five, six hundred acre feet of water out of that well. And I said, well, you're under an injunction for that well. And uh, she said, I had no idea. So, I mean, you know, the injunction came in the 70s. So, I mean, like you know, who, who researches all the paperwork. And I think that's a pretty common thing that uh, new city staff don't know the restrictions on their water system. That's an interesting observation because I think that's one of the things that happened. It's, it's like the organizational um, memory <laughs> gets lost when people go, I mean, um, I've seen examples where, you know, you have one person doing all these jobs, they retire and everybody's going, what the hell do we do now? Because there hasn't been that kind of organizational structure to support it. Uh, so I think that's a really important thing to do. And I think educating, and I think that's part of one of the parts of, of the RFP was to basically educate city and county employees about the history of, of and I, I'm still thinking, William, you'd be an excellent candidate to help with that. Uh, to really understand the history of the water, uh, what it means, what it, where it goes, those kinds of things, what it's done in the past. I mean, if we go back in time, uh, thank you, Aaron. We look forward to working with you. Um, but I mean, it's one of those things where, where, I mean, one of the problems we have is we work with one person and all of a sudden they, they got a new job and all of a sudden we're retraining another person. Um, and it's always kind of a little bit of a frustration. So those are the kind of things I think that we can, can address 
And I think it's a, a, an ongoing concern and an ongoing issue that we need to, to make sure people understand all of the kind of requirements and things that are involved with this water planning. Um, so that's um, my plan. Again, I will put it into a better form and I will have Maury uh, edit it because he has an exceptional job in doing that. Um, and so let's go on to the next pipeline, pipeline coalition. This is really, I'm, I'm yes, go ahead. Uh, one thing to consider that the, you know, but the city is still dealing with the two mile um, reservoir um, and yep. that will also help slow the water down when there's a flood situation. So um, currently the the river, as you know, goes uh, in a straightened course that's up kind of high and it's not the natural course of the river. And so there's that whole piece of that. You might want to insert a little something about that to give the city a little kick in the butt about it. That would be great. <laughs> that's such, uh, such um, an interesting, yes, William. Um, so in one of Kim Shanahan's columns, um, you know, he, because he was kind of close to the mayor, and they were proposing uh, a series of like beaver dams or something, maybe without the beavers, but small dams, <laughs> and then they were going to do it out in French's yeah. field. And, and so his column might be a good thing to reference in your paper. You know, okay. I don't know how practical any of that was or how scientific it was, but, you know, it, it was a theory out there. Okay. Would you email me a little note about that so I'll remember to do that? Cool. Thank you. Um, anything else about the wetland, I mean, about the spring restoration? So I want to talk about the Pipeline Coalition just for a second because... Um, so I, was, I kept thinking about how can the coalition and the uh, collaborative work together? And then I realized collaborative is kind of the leading entity in the coalition. Um, and we do have a lot of, of knowledge, incredible amount of knowledge in the pipeline coalition. And I really think that we need to fashion what we do going forward, working with uh, Deborah uh, along those same lines um, in terms of being able to provide in-depth research, in-depth comment um, that when given we can be given assignments that to help them move the process along um, and so I, I think the pipeline coalition can, and with collaborative support obviously uh, can do a lot of things to help this plan move quickly um, and I'm a little surprised about uh, Deborah saying it was a year from now that the plan was due um, my understanding it was due next week and so I want to it was due October 15th. And so I want to make sure uh, that we're all on the same page and that we have a year to do this project in or do the, the planning um, in. And so I will follow up with that and figure out uh, where Deborah got that, that figure. Um, so Maury, report from the Santa Fe watershed. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. I can also keep it pretty brief, but, um, you know, we have the standing slot. Um, we are continuing a lot of our programming in addition to kind of trying to respond to some of these uh, issues happening throughout the watershed that are outside of our general programming. But um, one thing that I'll hopefully be able to speak to more next meeting is kind of work to participate in the city's um, master planning process with the wastewater treatment plant and partnering, you know, both to find some short term solutions to mitigate the effects of the plant right now or within the next year, and also making sure that we are helping to foster ongoing community input in longer term planning and finding ways that we can um, be innovative and visionary in the future of wastewater treatment in the watershed and wastewater coming out of the plant and into the lower river. So um, I don't have a lot to update yet, but um, one thing um, I can't remember if this if I announced it at our last meeting, but 
um, you know, that that we've been receiving the E. coli data from the city, the the plant lab manager, um, and you know we encourage the city to have their own web page and develop their own communication and outreach strategy for lower river users and of course the entire watershed. But in the meantime, we have a web page on our own website with the data that um, the city provides us with, as well as some other links. And I'm. Uh, working to kind of fill that page out. So if you all have other links or other things that you'd like me to try to include on that page um, in sort of the interim, I'm open to feedback and, and addition for that. But um, you can access that from the Santa Fe River Traditional Communities Collaborative page on our website. Um, and also from the resources page on our website. So a couple of different ways to get there. Um, and I update that page whenever we receive updated data from the lab. So um, it's something, I know it's it's still not, I, I think we'd all love to work towards having something more like a, a tiered communication system directly from city employees that, um, can communicate emergencies, but also communicate ongoing water quality data and and uh, establish more constant communication. So this is maybe a first step, an interim step um, that we'll try to flesh out as time goes on. Um, so that's that's kind of a relevant thing we're working on with that and. Um, still very eager to support all of the projects that Carl mentioned, you know, and, and really help support lower watershed projects more. Um, one thing I'll flag to the group is that um, the NMED wetlands program is about to release their river steward grant uh, RFP um, within the next week or something, and that'll be open for 60 days. So there is a chance for, you know, and basically th those grants, um, I think this round is pretty well funded. So the grants are looking for pretty shovel ready, ready projects that have stakeholder support, that there's not a lot of stakeholder opposition, but a lot of stakeholder support. Um, and so if we wanted to um, work with community members to identify a project and apply for that grant. Um, I'd be open to working with you on that or finding another entity to apply for a grant. You know, there are a lot of great restoration nonprofits in our area that um, we could reach out to and get something um, started uh, on Carl's list. Um, so I think that that's another thing that I wanted to flag. One of the things I'll let you know, there is a water smart, this is the Bureau of Reclama Reclamation, has a grant opportunity that's due in January for aquatic restoration. And it is huge. It's in the millions. And so that's one of the things I think that as the city and county should apply for it. Obviously, now that I'm working with the city, I'm going to be pushing that uh, pretty hard. Um, so now I am very honored, privileged, and excited to announce the new um, co-chair of the Santa Fe River Traditional Communities Collaborative. You know, sometimes you run into a person who's um, smarter than you are, um, writes better than you are, um, has a, a deep and, and uh, abiding interest in, in the future of water in Santa Fe. Um, it's the next generation. Of, of people who care about water. And um, I every time I, I talk to this person, um, I learn a little bit more. Um, I get more impressed. Um, I remember uh, sending something to this person to uh, edit, and it came back, and I'm going, whoa, this was exceptional. I'm an English major, and so that that's um, to her credit. So with that, I'd like to announce that Maury Hensley is going to be the new co-chair of the Santa Fe Rivers Traditional Communities Collaborative. Uh, and I think she's exceptional. Yes, yes, let's give her a, a round of applause. Absolutely. 
Uh, I'm just excited as can be. Um, I, I enjoy the heck out of working with her. Um, and I think we're going to do some some special things as we move forward uh, with a real passion and understanding and appreciation of what stakeholders can do to, to bring about change. And I know most of the people are, are, aren't on right now, but again, this is something I've said many, many times before. And I think Bill actually uh, referenced this a little bit. This is a unique opportunity. Um, and this is a group that has brought this uh, opportunity forward. Um, and believe me, this is now, I think, our 12th year. Um, and we have struggled many years in figuring out how we can affect, influence, do things and make things better for the river um, and for the watershed. This moment now, um, mm -hmm. in terms of all of the different factors, John Dupuy being with the city, Michelle being with the county, and then our group, and, and we've got now we've got Deborah, um, that we can all do something that is reflective of the city of Santa Fe, the county of Santa Fe, um, as a forward-looking um, positive entity about addressing water issues. And I couldn't say that a year ago. I couldn't say that two years ago because it was all kind of a mixed up mess sometimes in terms of who to talk to and how to. Uh, thank you, Kathleen. Good to see you. Um, but it's one of those moments where I think that we, um, if we do things right, uh, if we're honest and sincere in, in our uh, in our intentions, um, that we can make a lasting um, change in terms of how water issues are approached in Santa Fe County and in the city of Santa Fe. And Maury, to me, is the example of leadership um, conscientious, smart leadership that we need. So I thank her for accepting uh, the co-chair position, and I look forward to, to working with her very closely. Um, so thank you, Maury. Appreciate it. Yay! Yay! <laughs> thank you, Carl, and thanks everybody. <laughs> I'm really, I'm really honored and and um, excited to keep working with this group, and I, I definitely see my role and and the role of the Watershed Association at, as a convener and a supporter of this group. That you know, it it seems operationally to make sense to have have the co chair position, but I really want to center your voices and your expertise, um, as Carl said, in this really important time that has a lot of opportunities, um, even as it has a lot of challenges. So um, yeah, really excited to keep working with you and very honored and a little embarrassed, you know, at, at Carl's kind words. <laughs> and um, yeah, so we'll, we'll keep I'm moving gonna, forward. I'm going to embarrass someone else for I'm going to embarrass someone else for a second. Um, and this is a person, whenever I uh, have some, whenever I need something and I contact her, it's immediately taken care of. Um, and it's one of your staff, Amara, who has been exceptional in terms of just being there and being taking care of things. And, and as I said, it's done quickly and it's done efficiently. And so I just wanted to recognize Amara as, as a, a really strong supporter of the collaborative and, and and what we're doing to to address water issues okay it. folks well once hey, again Samara. <laughs> yay <laughs> so um any final words comments suggestions i think this is a really good meeting go ahead william um, I don't know. I was just going through the chat and and uh, Bill Schneider has a big long request for action uh, that you know maybe people need to copy down. So can we get that posted somewhere in the chat? Yeah, we can figure out how. Oh, go ahead, Amara. Yeah, I was going to say I can copy and paste it and then we can maybe put it with the agenda next to the or just send it out. I don't know. Yeah, but, or maybe we can put it in the comments of the YouTube video. Mm -hmm. Something. Well, well, yeah. And anyway, that's what I like about you ladies. Anyway, all right. So um, thank you very much. Appreciate oh, it. Uh, I yes. do have one other thing. 
Um, so I think we need to look at adding to our steering committee um, uh, someone from La Cienega Valley Association and someone from Siena Guia so that we cover okay. each traditional community. That's a great idea. I, I agree with that completely and we'll work on that. <laughs> no, I think that's uh, completely true. You know, one of the things too that, that I don't think anybody talked about is Deborah's um, work with the Pueblos. I mean, that is obviously an ongoing uh, challenge um, and so her connections in that community, in those communities, uh, may be exactly what we need. Uh, Christine, thank you very much. Always good to see you. Um, but I think that that's, that's a, an element that has to be a part of what we're doing. And I'm hoping that she can bridge that gap between, um, the, um, city and county and the, and the Pueblos. So anyway. All right, folks. Andy, nice to meet you. I think you got your money's worth today. Um, <laughs> so again, thank you all for being part of um, a, an extraordinary meeting. Thank you so much. We'll we'll look to you, see you in a couple months. Thank you very Thanks, much. Thanks, Carl. Bye. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.